I should like to call attention this evening to that uh, well-known incident in the life of the early church, the account of which was read to us in the reading as it's to be found in the Gospel according to St. Luke in the last chapter, chapter 24, and the story goes from verse 13 to verse 35. But I take as my particular text verses 25, 26, and 27. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. But I want to look with you at this whole picture of these two men taking this well-known journey from Jerusalem down to Emmaus. Now it's very important as we look at this incident that we should remember the circumstances in which this event took place. Let's remember that this is something that happened after the resurrection had taken place. The whole significance of the story really is to be found in that fact that this could possibly happen after the resurrection had taken place. It's something that literally and actually happened, and happened to two who belonged to the company that had followed most intimately with our Lord. Now, as we look at these men, I'm going to invite you to look also at the state of the modern church. For here, it seems to me, is far too perfect a representation and portrayal of the state and the condition of the Christian church speaking generally at the present time. We were trying last night to consider the New Testament teaching concerning the nature, the doctrine of the church. And now we're going on to look at a picture of the church in a state of discouragement, a state of unhappiness, a state indeed of dejection and well-nigh hopelessness. And I believe that it is very important that we should do this together. I was saying toward the end last night that all this is so important for this reason, that the people outside the church get their impression of Christianity and of the Lord Jesus Christ and indeed of God himself from what they see in us. It's not surprising that they should arrive at their assessments and their judgments in that way. We are the people who make these great claims. We claim to be the people of God. We claim to be partakers of the divine nature. We claim to be special and unique people who have an answer to the problem, solution to the great problems of life. So they very naturally look at us and they judge all we stand for and all we claim to believe by what they see in us. And I think there can be very little dispute amongst us concerning this matter. That it is because of what they see in us that so many are outside the Christian church at the present time. Now, I know that there are many who, looking at the state of the church today, feel that the one thing for us to do is to start considering immediately what we can do in order to attract and to win the outsider. That's a perfectly right and good thing to think of, of course. But they start with that. They say, here we are, and there are the people indifferent outside. And immediately they begin to consider ways and means and methods of interesting and attracting such people who are outside. And they seem to be, some of them, prepared to go to almost any lengths and to borrow any measures conceivable from the world itself 
in order to do something to get hold of these people. Now, while I'm in entire agreement with evangelism and would go so far as to say that the primary task of the Christian church is evangelism, I do nevertheless suggest that when we start immediately to think of methods of what we can do to attract those who are outside, we are starting at the wrong point. I suggest that the first question we should ask is this. Why are those people outside? And I've already given my own answer to that question. And indeed it is the answer that they themselves give. They are outside very largely because of what they see in us who are inside. So I hold the view and suggest it to you that the first question that ought to be engaging us is this. What is wrong with us? What can we do about ourselves in order that we may attract the world outside instead of repelling it? Surely this is the first step. Instead of assuming that all is more or less all right with us and then considering means and methods of winning the outsider, we should be concerned about whatever it is in us that is repelling the outsider and deal with it and bring ourselves into such a state and condition that we become an attraction and create within them the desire to be amongst us and to share the things which we enjoy. That is why it seems to me that all this is so important for us. For some reason or another we seem to be giving the impression to the world that is outside that one of the main effects of becoming a Christian is to make one miserable and to create problems and difficulties and perplexities. Let me put it to you in a very simple picture. Look at the people who want to attend some game or other on a Saturday afternoon. Watch them as they prepare to go to the meeting. They keep their eye on the clock. They're anxious to be there to the minute, indeed, before anything starts. And watch them as they go along. They're all rushing in their keenness and in their anxiety. They don't want to miss a single item. They want to see it from beginning to end. And so they rush in order to get there with this great enthusiasm. Then watch them and listen to them while the game is being played. And you will hear them shouting. You'll see them smiling, you'll see them almost in a state of ecstasy, They're almost beyond themselves. They are so enjoying it all and so thrilled by it all. And then it finishes. Watch them as they go home. They're all talking with animation, one commenting on this and the other on that. They seem to have been having a marvelous time and their faces are smiling. These people have been moved and they've been thrilled. They've been doing something, obviously, which is very wonderful. And they've spent hours in doing it. That's the picture, isn't it, of the world. Indulging in its pleasures and the things in which it believes. Now come and have a look at a corresponding number of Christian people, church members. Sunday morning arrives. What is the picture? Well, they're rather doubtful whether they really will get up or not to go to church. After all, they're having a very busy life. And a man must have some rest sometime. They didn't say that on Saturday. But this is how they feel on Sunday morning. That really, this is a bit of a burden. And they're a bit doubtful and hesitant whether they'll go or not. But after, and in the end, they decide, that, well, they will go. After all, it's a matter of duty. So they get up, and uh, are they anxious to be there before anything starts and to make sure that they get the best front seat in order that they may miss nothing? Well, I leave you to answer for yourselves. The people on Saturday afternoon had only one complaint about what they did, and that was that it came to an end and it finished so quickly. Is it like that with Christian people when they come to church on Sunday? Do they complain that it ends too quickly? But even before you come to the end, what are they like during the proceedings? 
Are they moved with enthusiasm? Are they alive and alert and watching and waiting and listening? And how do they sing and do all that they do? Is it similar to what happened on the Saturday afternoon? And then watch them as they go home. Do they give the impression to people that they've been doing something wonderful and amazing? That they've had the richest and the highest experience that is ever possible to a human being in this world? Are they talking with any mission to one another about some aspect of the glory of the gospel or something that was made clear in the preaching of the word? Do they give this impression, I say, that they've been enjoying themselves and that they've been moved and thrilled by what has been happening? Well, I simply ask you to decide what is the correct and the true answer to that question. My friends, the masses of people are outside the Christian churches because we, for some reason or another, are giving the impression that we are miserable people, that our heart isn't in it. We are far too much like these two men on the way to a mass, in other words. And that's why I'm calling your attention to this whole subject. I want to make this plain and clear. It must be obvious to those who were here last night that this is clearly a burden with me, and it is. I am more and more convinced that the individual church member is more important today than he or she has been for several centuries. It is not only the pulpit that matters. It is the individual Christian. We are living in days when it's ceasing to be the custom and the habit and the thing to do for people to attend a place of worship. And I predict to you that in the next 10 years, this is going to become an acute problem. People are talking already about a religionless Christianity or Christianity without the church. And we've got to meet this acute problem. And the question is, are we ready for this? And it is my contention that the main responsibility at the moment rests upon the individual church member. It doesn't matter how wonderful a preacher you may have if nobody will come and listen to him. And after all, the preacher is going to be judged by the character of the people who listen to him. And if they give the impression that this is something depressing or something that is against the grain, well then I say it's not at all surprising that those people who are outside are not interested to come and listen to this preacher or to indulge in an act of worship. In other words, I believe that we've got to look seriously at this picture that is recorded for us here in this last chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. Look at these two men on the road to Emmaus. Remember the resurrection has just happened. But here they are walking in this dejected condition on the road to Emmaus. Now you notice that our Lord realized that these men were miserable and were sad because when he joined them, this is what he said to them. Uh, he said, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? How did he know they were sad? He hadn't heard what they said, but how did he know that they were sad? The answer is that if you feel sad, you look it. The man who's sad is a man who takes a certain stance. Everything about him suggests misery and unhappiness and sadness, whereas the man who's happy and alert and joyful, he shows it by his whole demeanor. The thing is radiating. You can't feel sad without looking it. And as I'm suggesting, the Christian church gives this melancholy impression to the world today because she is in a state of melancholy herself. And it seems to me that the best approach, therefore, to this whole incident is to look at it in terms of the state of the heart of these people and apply that to the state of the heart of the church today. In this paragraph, we are told three things about the state of the heart of these people. The first is 
that they had a sad heart. The second is that they were slow of heart. But thank God the third thing is the burning heart. And here we have a summary of this whole message. The great need of the church today in her sadness and in her slowness is to discover the secret of having the burning heart. Now this is something of course that has been true of the church many a time before. The church seems to go through these various phases from time to time and from century to century. But you will find in them that the great periods in the history of the church, revival and reformation, are always characterized by this burning heart. The condition in which these men ended. And I say the great question for us is this. To discover what we have to do in order that we may have this burning heart. You know, the moment the church gets this, the problem of evangelism is solved and the problem of the outsider is solved. The moment the church gets on fire, the world is interested. It's interested in the phenomenon. We were looking at last night at Acts 2. The moment these men were filled with the Spirit, this fire of the Holy Ghost, everybody came rushing to look at them. And it's happened in the same way throughout the running centuries. There is nothing more important than this. Very well then, let's make an analysis of these people. Why were they sad? That's the first obvious question to ask. Let's make our own analysis of them. And then we can look at our Lord's analysis of them. Fortunately, he analyzed them as well and dealt with them. But start with our own analysis. Why were these men in this dejected condition on this particular morning of the resurrection of all mornings? Here is the tragedy of the situation, that this was possible. It's equally the tragedy that the church can be as she is today. What was the cause of it? Well, these men, you know, they really give themselves away. This is what I read about them. The two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. Now listen. And as they talked together of all these things which had happened, and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, there it is. This is the cause of the trouble. There they are walking on the road to Emmaus, and what are they talking about? Not the resurrection, talking of the things that had happened, the wonderful three years they'd had with him. One remembered this sermon and another remembered the other sermon, and then this miracle and that miracle, they went over the past history, and they talked of what had already taken place and had gone, and while they're doing so, they're unhappy and miserable and dejected in the present. Isn't this a perfect picture of the church today? So often we just spend our time in talking about the great days that once were. The things that some of us even remember, those of us who get older, we are particularly prone to this trouble. And we talk about the past and we begin to idealize it. And the more we do so, the more miserable and unhappy we become. But this is what they were doing, and this is what so many are still doing. Looking to the past, talking about the past. Tradition is an excellent thing, but when you live on it, and when you become depressed by it, you've already got a wrong attitude towards it. But then in addition to that, we have these terms that they communed and reasoned together. What does this mean? Well, now what was happening was this. They were trying to understand the position in which they thought they were. They reminded themselves of his person, the person of the Lord, as I say of his preaching, and of the extraordinary power that he had manifested in his miracles. And yet, he had died in utter weakness, 
and the body had been taken down and had been buried in a grave. You see, everything they say betrays this terrible fallacy uh, when our Lord comes and challenges them and says, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and uh, crucified. But we had trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. But alas, he died in utter weakness and they've buried him in a grave. And that's what they were talking about together. And then they began to reason about this. How to explain it, how to understand it, how could it have happened and so on. Well, I mustn't keep you. But you know, whenever I read this passage, I'm always reminded of the great annual assemblies of any one of the great denominations. This is more or less exactly what they all do. Somebody comes forward and reads out the statistics. And then they begin to reason together about the statistics. And they begin to consider the problems. They'll probably end by setting up a commission to investigate the cause of our troubles. We are experts on the problem and on the difficulty. We know all about communism. We know all about rationalism and this and that. We reason together and we make our comments. And the more we commune and reason and talk, the more and more depressed we become. Exactly as these men on the road to Emmaus. But you know, I think the real ultimate explanation as we can see it of these men was justice. They were so certain of the death of our Lord that they'd forgotten all about the resurrection. They were looking so much at the fact that he'd been put to death and had been buried that they'd become absolutely blind to everything else. Now this is a very extraordinary psychological condition. And I suggest to you that this is the condition of the church today that we are all looking so much at our problems and our difficulties that we become blind to the solution. We are experts in our problems. Never has the church been so able in analyzing our difficulties. The books that come out of the presses almost daily, they're all experts at, de- at analyzing and diagnosing the cause of our troubles. But there's never any solution. We spend the whole time circulating round and round and reasoning and communing and talking together concerning our difficulties. And this has a very paralyzing effect. Forgive me if in my desire to bring out this point clearly, I put it in the form of an anecdote, an incident, something that happened in my own ministry and in my own experience. I'll never forget this. I remember preaching in a place in my homeland of Wales Somewhere in the early 1930s, I was preaching in a country place, afternoon and evening. And when I'd finished the service in the afternoon, and I'd come down from the pulpit, two ministers came on to me and had a request to make, and the request was this. They said, I wonder whether you do us a kindness. Well, I said, if I can, I'll be very happy to do so. Well, they said, we think you can. There's a very tragic case here. It's the case, they said, of our local schoolmaster. He's a very fine man. And he was one of the best church workers in the district. But he's got into a very sad condition. He's given up all his church work. He just manages to keep going in his school. But from the standpoint of church life and activity, he has become more or less useless. What's the matter with him, I said? Well, they said he's got into some kind of depressed condition, complains of headaches and pains in his stomach and so on. Would you be good enough to see him? And I promised to do so. And after I'd had my tea, this man, the schoolmaster, came to see me. 
And I said to him, well now, he looked depressed. He was like the men on the road to Emmaus. One glance at this man told me all about him. He'd got the typical face and attitude of a man who's depressed and discouraged. I said, now, tell me, what's uh, the trouble? Well, he said, you know, I get these headaches. I'm never free from headache. I wake up with it in the morning. And he couldn't sleep too well, and he'd got these other gastric pains and so on. Well, now I said, tell me, how long have you been like this? Oh, he said, it's been going on for years. As a matter of fact, he said, it's been going on since 1915. Well, I said, I'm interested to hear this. How did it begin? Well, he said, I'll tell you. When the war broke out in 1914, I volunteered very early on and went in for the Navy. And eventually, he said, I was transferred to a submarine. And this submarine, he said, I was in, was eventually sent to the Mediterranean. He said, you remember the, camp the Gallipoli campaign? Well, he said, the part of the Navy I belonged to was involved in this Gallipoli campaign. So I was there in this submarine in the Mediterranean during this campaign. And one afternoon, he said, we were engaged in an action. We were submerged and, and, uh, in, in the sea, and there we were all doing our duties, he said, but suddenly there was a most terrible thud. And our submarine, he said, shook. We'd been hit by a mine, he said, and down we sank to the bottom of the Mediterranean. And he said, you know, I've never been the same man since. I've had this trouble ever since. Well, I said, that's all right, but please tell me the rest of your story. Well, he said, there's nothing really more to say. He said, I, I'm just telling you that uh, that's how I've been ever since that happened to me in the Mediterranean. But my dear friend, I said, I, I really would be interested to know uh, the remainder of the story. But he said, I've told you the whole story. Well, this went on for some considerable time. It was a part of my treatment of him, you see. I said, now, I really would like to know the whole story. Start at the beginning again. And he told me how he'd volunteered, joined the Navy, sent to a submarine, submarine sent to the Mediterranean. Everything all right until the afternoon. They were engaged in the action. The sudden thud and the submarine shook. Down we went to the bottom of the Mediterranean. And I've been like this ever since. But I said, tell me. <laughs> I said, tell me the rest of the story. I'm very glad you're laughing because you're really laughing at yourselves as I'm going to show you. Wait a minute. I said, but do tell me the rest of the story. He said, but I, I have no more to tell you. And then, of course, I brought it to this point. Now I said, let's go over it all again. So I took him over it step by step. We came to this dramatic afternoon. The thud, the shaking of the submarine, down we went to the bottom of the Mediterranean. Go on, I said. He said, there's nothing more to be said. I said, are you still at the bottom of the Mediterranean? <laughs> you see, physically he wasn't, but mentally he was. He had remained at the bottom of the Mediterranean ever since. So I went on to explain to him, my dear fellow, I said, that's your whole trouble. All your troubles are due to the fact that in your own mind you are still at the bottom of the Mediterranean. Why didn't you tell me that somehow or another you came up to the surface and that a man on another ship saw you and got hold of you and got you on board that ship that you were treated there in the hospital on that dreadnought and eventually brought back to England and put into a hospital? I got all these facts out of him. I said, why didn't you tell me all that? You stopped, I said down at the bottom of the Mediterranean. And it was because he'd done that in his mind that he'd suffered from this terrible depression during all those years. I'm happy to be able to tell you that as a result of this explanation, that men became perfectly well, immediately resumed his duties, and within a year became a candidate for ordination in the Anglican Church in Wales, and he's still a vicar of a church in that country. Now, I've simply told you this story in order to show you the condition of these men 
on the road to Emmaus. Here they are, you see. He died and he was buried. We had thought, well, oh, what's the use of thinking? They killed him, they crucified him, they tried him, and they condemned him unjustly. And he died and they buried him, and he's in the grave. There he is, they're so certain of that. But they've become oblivious of everything else and blind to everything else. And I have a fear, my dear friends, that that's the trouble with so many of us. We are so aware of the problem, so immersed in it, so looking at it, that we've forgotten all the glory that is around us and seen nothing but the problem which leads to this increasing dejection. Well, now, that's my analysis of these men on the road to Emmaus. But let's go on and look at our Lord's analysis of them. It's much more devastating. Do you notice what he had to say about them? The first thing he said about them was this. Then he said unto them, when at last they gave him a chance to say anything, they'd been talking so much that our Lord didn't have an opportunity to open his mouth. He simply put the question and then they poured it all out on him. We had thought this. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth, the marvelous things he did, all our hopes. We thought he was the Messiah. But ah! And on and on and on they go. At last they finished the wretched, miserable story. Then he said unto them, What? Oh, fools. And again I say, I have an awful feeling that that's what he's saying about us tonight and to us. You fools. What he means, of course, that we are dullards. That we are simpletons. That we don't know how to think and use our reason. That we allow ourselves to be governed by circumstances and accident and change and the things that happen to us and the conditions in which we find ourselves. And instead of using our minds and our reason and our understanding and applying the truth that we've received, we allow ourselves to be influenced by these other things and end in this state of misery and dejection and discouragement. What a terrible word it is, but my dear friends, isn't it true of us? Fools! Simpletons! Dollars! This is something that is said very frequently in the New Testament. The Apostle Peter, you remember in his first epistle, writing to those Churches, those unknown people whose very names he didn't know, those strangers scattered abroad in various countries, they were having a hard and a difficult time. They were enduring terrible persecution. Those were their conditions. Do you remember one of the first things Peter tells to them? Here it is. Gird up the loins of your mind. Here's the first thing. The church has got to think. She's got to use her mind and her reason. The tragedy is that we tend to fall back on other things constantly, somehow or another to relieve ourselves and to keep things going. We are sentimental. Sentimentality is very largely the trouble with the present church. We are very nice people, but we're very foolish people. And the first thing we've got to do is to awaken and to gird up the loins of our mind and to think and to understand the truth and begin to apply it to the situation in which we find ourselves instead of giving way, instead of giving in, instead of just commiserating with one another. Uh, we are very nice people, you know, we members of the Christian church, but I'm afraid sometimes that the church is dying of niceness. We are very good at praising one another, are we not? And saying well, that we are doing well. And we, those of us in the ministry perhaps are very fond of praising the ladies. How wonderful they are. How could we get on without them and so on. And we've become a mutual admiration society. And we are sympathizing and communing with one another. 
and uh, thus sentimentalizing with one another and the whole time the condition of the church degenerates from bad to worse. Fools! We must awaken. Guard up the lines of our mind. Be men and apply our understanding to the situation in which we are by in which we are by which we are confronted. That's our Lord's first word to these people. It's alarming, it's surprising, but alas it's true. And then he goes on to the second thing. O oh, fools and slow of heart. Now what's this condition? Well here again to me is the most interesting condition. Slow of heart. This is not uh, the mind so much now as the, uh, this other part of us, slow of heart. And surely we all know something about this. It doesn't only mean the affections. It means, in a sense, one's general condition. And I know of nothing that is uh, so dangerous in the Christian life as this condition of being slow of heart. What does it mean? Well, you've all had it, you've all experienced it. This is the sort of thing it means. Uh, there you are seated in your home, you may be in your study or in some other room, and uh, you've been reading the newspaper, and you were taking it in, and you were alive and alert, and then uh, you perhaps took up another book, perhaps you took up a novel, biography or something like that, and you were reading it and enjoying it, then you suddenly feel an impulse or a call to read the scriptures. You haven't read your scriptures much that day. Suddenly this arises within you, a call to read the scriptures. So you put down what you were reading and you pull out your Bible, and uh, you open at a passage of scripture and you begin to read, and immediately you begin to feel tired. You begin to yawn, and you begin to realize that you've had a very heavy day, and that really you're not in a fit condition to concentrate. You find it very difficult to do so, and your mind wanders, and you can't keep your attention on what you're reading. And you then try prayer. It's exactly the same. You, you can't control your minds and your thoughts. You've got nothing to say, as it were, or your imagination travels all over the world. A deadness, a lethargy creeps over you. Haven't you heard this many times? That's what's meant by slowness of heart. Oh, fools and slow of heart. The devil afflicts us with this kind of spiritual lethargy. He seems to inject some kind of jaundice into us that paralyzes us and makes us dull and we can't rouse ourselves. We can be animated in conversation with others. We suddenly become speechless when we are confronted by God. We can read other things, I say, but not this. This is slowness of heart. This is the devil, as it were causing this poison to circulate in our spiritual system. And so all our faculties are paralyzed. That is one of the troubles, you know, with depression. It affects the whole man. It affects his muscles. He becomes muscularly weak. He can't think clearly. He, he, he can't do anything properly. It paralyzes the whole of the system. Slowness of heart. Now this is something that we have to be conscious of. It's not enough that I say, well, I don't feel like it now. I should ask myself, why don't I feel like it now? This is a condition that's got to be dealt with. We've got to stir ourselves up. We've got to rouse ourselves. Not only gird up the lines of our mind, we've got to stir up the gift that is in us. This was, as you know, the great disease of Timothy, wasn't it? The young men was always complaining about his difficulties and his problems to the Apostle Paul. And that's what the Apostle tells him, to stir up the gift that is in him. Break the fire, wake up. Get rid of this dullness, this slowness, this lethargy. Shake it off. Away, dull sloth and melancholy, as Milton once put it. Now this, you see, is the second thing that our Lord says about these people. He's severe with them. And of course he's severe with them. 
It's wrong that they should be in this condition. It's a disgrace, it's a scandal, it's a sin, it's a denial of him and all that is so true of him. So he deals with them with great severity. And it is this kind of severity that has generally preceded revival in the Christian church. Painful though it is, my friends, we've got to face it. And then, of course, he goes on to the next thing, which is, of course, the really crucial thing. Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. That's the emphasis. All that the prophets have spoken. Now, this is a very significant thing. These men, you see, were Jews. And they'd been brought up on their Jewish scriptures. And they were familiar with what the prophets had spoken. Our Lord refers to Moses and the prophets. And later on he had to do the same thing with the entire assembled company of all the disciples. We read in verse 44 that he said, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And that's what he did with these two men on the road to Emmaus. Now they were familiar with these scriptures. What was their trouble then? Ah, this was the trouble with them very largely because they were Jews. As Jews, they had believed certain things in the scriptures. What things? Well, the coming of the Messiah. This was the great hope of the Jews. This was something taught away back in Genesis. Taught right away through in type. Taught by the great prophets in particular. The Messiah, the Deliverer that was to come. And of course, this was the thing that thrilled the Jews and they held on to this. Yes, but you remember that they had their own conception as to what this Messiah would be like when he came. They tended to think of him as a great political deliverer and even a great military deliverer. Their idea of the kingdom of God, you see, was an external one, was a material one, a political, social one. And their idea of the Messiah was that he'd be a great personage, commanding great armies, and that he'd lead them to victory. He'd restore them to the position that they'd once occupied in the days of the great King David. He was to come of the seed of David, and he, they were to be the world conquerors, the people over all the world. This was the essence of their talk. And so you see, when the Messiah was condemned and crucified in apparent utter weakness and died and his dead body was taken down and put in a grave, they were utterly bewildered, utterly disconsolate, utterly cast down. Why? Well, because they'd only believed certain things that were in their scriptures. They had selected out of the scriptures the thing that suited them, the things that appealed to their national pride and national sentiment, the things that thrilled them, their idea of the, script, uh, of the Messiah. All that they had taken from the scriptures. But as he points out to them, their whole trouble was due to the fact that they had not believed all that the prophets had spoken. For the prophets had made it perfectly plain and clear as he points out to them, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? The prophets have not only spoken about a great deliverer, they've spoken of one who is to be as a lamb led to the slaughter, as one who is going to cry out in agony, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The prophets have spoken about the very things that have taken place, but they hadn't listened to them then. They'd forgotten all that and had only concentrated on what appealed to them and what pleased them. And it was because of this wrong and false attitude to the scriptures that they're now in this state of utter dejection. 
And therefore our Lord expostulates with them and reprimands them. He said, you don't even apply your minds to your scriptures. You're thinking sentimentally and passionately. Why don't you take your minds and use them on the very scriptures of which you boast? And what of all that I've taught you? What of all that I said to you? All this, you see, they had not really grasped. They were so fascinated for the time being perhaps by his personality that they never really understood when he told them that he was going to be taken by cruel men and crucified and put to death and rise again. He told it them several times. They never got hold of it. And so when it happened, they were utterly confounded and cast down in dejection and in despair. It is the failure to take all that the scriptures have written. I need scarcely turn aside neither to point out the application of this to the church at the present time. Isn't this the real explanation of the Christian church today? Somewhere around about the 30s of the last century, that devastating movement began in Germany, that rationalism that led to the so-called higher criticism of the scriptures. What is higher criticism? Higher criticism is men picking and choosing out of the scriptures, believing what he likes, rejecting the rest, or ignoring the rest. Man failing to submit himself completely and utterly and entirely to the whole of the scriptures. Now I believe that this is one of the most urgent problems confronting us this morning. I was delighted to hear in the discussion this morning Dr. Strong uh, dealing with this matter. I think it's going to be one of the most urgent problems. There are even evangelical people today who are no longer believing the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. They're not believing all the scriptures. But my friends, until we come back to a belief in all the scriptures, we shall be in trouble because we are setting ourselves up as authorities and we are not competent to deal with the problems. If we pick and choose here and believe this and reject that, we'll have no authority whatsoever ultimately. And we'll be so anxious to please the modern scientists, the modern educated men, that we'll have lost our gospel. The Bible is a unity. We must take it all. The Bible not only teaches us salvation, it teaches us creation. He tells us how God made the world and how he's eventually going to restore the whole cosmos. If you begin to pick and choose in the scriptures, you'll soon end in this state of dejection. And this is what the Christian church has been doing for so long. And it's not surprising that things are as they are. Here is our Lord telling these men, and I believe he's saying it to us tonight, that we have got to submit to this completely entire whether we understand or cannot whether we can reconcile everything or not we must submit to it we say we know nothing apart from this but we believe this is the word of god and everything it says it's history it's account of the creation and the fall all these things which are presented as facts we must accept as facts Otherwise, we shall soon be doubting the fact of Christ himself, and some even doubting the very being of God himself. Here, you see, is our Lord's own analysis. There is a unity in the scripture which, which must never be broken. There is a wholeness and a completeness. And it is only as we submit to this, I say, that we can look to the real solution of our problem. But then, there is our Lord's analysis, and he goes on and he deals with them. And do you remember what happened? They went, and they came nigh to the village where they went, and he made as, as if he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent, and he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and break and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? 
And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. What a transformation. Look at these two miserable men going down to Emmaus in their melancholic attitude and stance, talking and reasoning and communing, hopeless. Look at them going back. Look at them hurrying. Look at them rushing. Look at them addressing the others, filled with fire and enthusiasm and hope and glory and rejoicing. What is it? The burning heart. And that's the question. How do you get the burning heart? Oh, says someone, you know, you're really depressing us in this way. Those men got the burning heart because the Lord Jesus was with them and because they recognized him. That's how they got the burning heart, is it? That isn't what the record says. And this to me is a very glorious thing. What made the hearts of these men burn? Well, they tell you themselves. This is how they put it. When they talked to one another after he'd gone, they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures, their hearts were burning before they recognized him. That's the significant and the wonderful thing. It wasn't after they recognized him, after their eyes were opened, that their hearts began to burn. Their hearts were burning as they, when they still regarded him as a stranger. But as he was opening to them the scriptures, as they were walking together on the way, thank God for this. I've known many a men, and I've felt it myself many a time, I'm ashamed to say. I've said to myself, if only I could have seen the Lord Jesus with my natural eyes, as the people did who were alive in his day, oh, how different would I be? If only one could have seen him, it would have made all the difference. That's a very great fallacy. You don't need to have a vision. You don't need to see him with your natural eyes. There's only one thing that is necessary for, the, for this burning heart, and it is this very thing, that you find him in the scriptures. It was as he opened the scriptures, showing this amazing plan of God, this increasing revelation. You see, he took them back right away to Moses, we are told. You see, you don't even need your New Testament to get a burning heart. You can get it from the Old Testament if you know how to read it. What did he do? He took them back to, Ge to Genesis 3.15 and told them about the promise that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head. There was the first promise of the deliverer, the Messiah, and already they began to feel better. And he took them right through it all promise that was made to Noah, the promise that was made to Abram. He took them right away through, showed it that even in the law of Moses, the lamb, the burnt offerings, the sacrifices, what they all mean, they're pointing forward. Yes, but it's a sacrifice. A death is involved. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. He took them through all this, showing how he is to be found everywhere in the Old Testament scriptures. And then on to the Psalms, and then on to the prophets, and all of them saying the same thing, pointing on to him. Yes, but not only in his great power as a deliverer, but as I say, as the lamb led to the slaughter, as the burnt offering, as the sacrifice, as the one who's going to die that we might be forgiven and rise again, conquering all his enemies and bring life and immortality to light through his gospel. That's what he did with them. And it was as he did that with them and explained and expounded this as he did later with the entire assembled company that their hearts began to burn and their whole condition was transformed. 
and my dear friends that is the position with us tonight. I ask no dream, no prophet ecstasy, no sudden rending of the veil of clay. What is my prayer then? Take the dimness of my soul away. That's all we need. Don't look for phenomena. Don't look for strange, amazing, semi-magical something. Go to the scriptures. But ah, you say, it was the Lord Jesus Christ who expounded the scriptures to them. And of course, if he only did that with me, I believe that my heart would be burning. But he doesn't come to us like this now. Wait a minute, my friend. Don't fall into the same mistake as Thomas fell of old. You remember poor Thomas? When he was told of the resurrection, he said, I won't believe it. I don't believe it. I can't believe it. It's impossible. Unless I can see marks of the nails in his hand and that wound in his side and thrust my hand in it, feel it all, I won't believe it. You remember what our Lord said to him? Thomas, he said, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed. No, no, my dear friends, his literal physical presence is not necessary. We were being told this morning the answer to this question. He has sent another comforter. He has sent the Holy Ghost. And he is the teacher. He is the expounder. He is the one who brings all back to our remembrance what was taught by the Lord himself and explains it and makes it clear. This is the secret of every saint that has ever lived. They haven't seen the Lord, but they were able to say with the writer of that hymn, Jesus, these eyes have never seen that radiant form of thine. The veil of flesh hangs dark between thy blessed face and mine. But he was able to go on. I see thee not. I hear thee not. Yet thou art oft with me, and earth hath ne'er so dear a spot as where I meet with thee. He has promised to manifest himself to his people. He has promised to make himself known to them. And they can meet with him. And they are ravished and their hearts begin to burn as they meet with him. The spirit mediates him. He was sent to do this. And this, as I said at the beginning, has been the secret of every individual whom God has used in the long history of the church as it has been the secret of the church as a whole in periods of revival and reformation. Let me give you the notable, well-known example of this very thing. The whole thing, I say, turns on this. How to get rid of this dull, sad, slow heart and get the burning heart. See it in the case of John Wesley. Brilliant, erudite men. Religious, moral, zealous, gave up a wonderful post in the University of Oxford, his fellowship there, and crossed the Atlantic with all its hazards over 200 years ago to preach to the poor natives down here at Savannah in Georgia. And yet was a miserable man, a miserable fellow. Said himself that as he tried to preach to those poor natives, he felt he needed to be converted himself. He was an unhappy man. He was a miserable man. And he went back in the same condition to England and was a failure and would have died a failure but for one thing. You don't think of him as a failure. You think of him as a flaming evangelist. What made the difference to him? Well, he's told us himself. The story's well known. He went one evening to a little meeting in Aldersgate Street in London on May the 24th, 1738, utterly dejected, absolutely cast down, 
feeling that he was useless, doubting everything. And what was, the, what was happening in the meeting? It was a very small meeting, not a big meeting, and there wasn't even a man preaching. But there was a man standing up, and he was reading out of the preface of Luther's commentary on the epistle to the Romans, not even reading the commentary, simply reading out of the preface. And there was this little man reading, and John Wesley said as he was listening to him, suddenly he said, his heart began to burn within him. My heart began to burn within me. And he said, I knew that my sins, even my sins, were forgiven. The cold iceberg of a heart began to melt and to thaw, and the fire came in, and the man became a flaming evangelist. John the Baptist prophesied that when our Lord came, he would baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Where's the fire, my friend? The Spirit descended on the day of Pentecost, cloven tongues as a fire, the fire of God, the fire of Mount Carmel, the fire that gives energy and power to a preacher and to a people in their prayer, in their witnessing, in everything, the fire that burns away the dross and the alloy and the refuse and produces the pure gold of a sanctified person, ultimate complete in the glory. The burning heart is the one great need and necessity of every one of us. Have you got it? If you haven't realized why you haven't, you're a fool. You're not giving your time to this. You're spending your time with your television or your radio or your newspaper. Give time to the scriptures. Bring your mind at its best. Discipline it. Read the scriptures, start in Genesis, go right away through, look for him. Never do it without praying the Spirit to enlighten your eyes and to open them and to give you understanding. Ask for this blessed unction and anointing that alone can enable you to find him. Look for him, the living Christ, the resurrected Christ. Look for him everywhere in the scriptures and as you and spend most of our time in analysis of the problem? Shame on us! Let's stop looking at our problem. Let's search for him in the scriptures and find him and look at him and bask in the sunshine of his face until our cold hearts begin to burn and we'll scarcely be able to contain ourselves in the joy and in the ecstasy which we shall experience. God have mercy upon us and give us this burning heart. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we again come into thy holy presence and humble ourselves before thee. Lord God, awaken us out of our intellectual laziness and lethargy, our slowness and dullness of heart and of spirit. O oh God, awaken us and arouse us, and warm our hearts by the flame of thy Holy Spirit, and make of us a people who shall know that we belong to a risen and a victorious Lord, who shall reign from pole to pole, and conquer his every enemy. Hear us, O Lord, for his blessed name's sake. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.